Am I gonna die? What is that? The scythe of the Grim Reaper being sharpened? What? Hello humans, my name is Dale Kingsmill. I'm bringing you a story today. Gawain and the Green Knight from Arthurian legend. We did it once before, we're doing it again. Hopefully shorter this time. I just, I have distinct memories of it being very long. I intended to do this video uh, and get it up before Christmas, but uh, as it turns out, there's a lot to do before Christmas, as there is every year. But it's okay! Turns out it's a New Year's story as well. Do I have... maybe... No, I was hoping I had like party poppers in my bag, uh, as I often do, but it turns out that uh, airport security took them off me the last time I went to LA. Alright, so the story begins at Christmas tide. Arthur loves Christmas, he friggin' loves it, so he's declared they're gonna have a feast and it's gonna last the whole week. Christmas to New Year's, everyone's feasting, everyone's partying, dances, wine, keg stands probably, let's be real, it's, it's the Knights of the Round Table. If that's not a mythological equivalent of a frat, I don't know what is. So they're having their great time telling all their stories, but by the time we get to New Year's Eve, what should happen? But a giant green man bursts into the hall on a giant green horse. Doesn't that happen to you every year on New Year's Eve? Ugh, oh, what a nuisance. Now the poet who wrote Gawain and the Green Knight uh, gets a little stuck on the description of said knight. Starts out pretty strong, like, dude was huge. Now here's a quote from line 138. It says, from broad neck to buttocks so bulky and thick. Note, I have spelt it in my notes. T-H-I-double-C. But the giant has this tiny, teeny, itty bitty waist. So he's like proper Dorito shape. Like, we call Chris Evans a Dorito, but he's got nothing on this giant green knight. But then the poet gets a little uh, sidetracked. The guy was green, and everything he wore was green. The most green green you ever did see. His boots were green, and his hat was green, and his beard was green, and his nails were green, and his skin was green, and his hair was green, and his gloves were green. Okay, I think we get the picture. And the saddle was green, and the stirrups were green, and his pants were green, and his horse was green. It's, I, we've got it. And his teeth were green, and his eyebrows were green, and his eyes were green. Yes, they were green. No, they were red. Sure. Literally, the step-by-step -step description of all the green stuff that belonged to the Green Knight goes from line 150 to line 224. That's too many lines. Anyway, the important thing is that the Green Knight is like a Fey Warden up in here. He's coming in looking like a straight-up fairy prince. And so he bashes down the door, charges in on his horse, and he calls Arthur out. Arthur's just like, chill out, dude, come eat. You're welcome to come and eat with us. You didn't have to crash the party, could have just asked for an invite. But the Green Knight's like, nah, bruh, I keep hearing all this talk, all this chatter, all this buzz about how great you and all your knights of the circular countertop are. So I thought I'd come and I'd challenge you to a Christmas game so that you can prove it. And Arthur says, it's the knights of the round table and you know it. Greed knight's like, hey buddy, calm down. I didn't come here to wage war. Do you see me with an army behind me? Nah, I just came here for a simple Christmas game. But if that's too much for you, I mean, it makes sense, really. I mean, I don't see any men here. All I see are beardless children. Arthur's getting riled up. It's working. He's like, Christmas game? You're on. Tell me the damn rules. Is it beer pong? Because I'm great at beer pong. Flip cup? Is it flip cup? The game is this. I stand rock still and whoever is man enough picks up my axe and swings it at me however they like and I will not move. But whatever stroke he lands on me, I get to deal back to him in a year and a day. No one immediately leaps up to take the Green Knight up on his offer. Understandable, really. So the Green Knight just stands there, insulting them one by one. Calls Arthur a chicken! And if there's one thing that King Arthur and Marty McFly have in common, it's that nobody calls him chicken. Art steps forward and he takes up the axe and he's headed for that Green Knight. But then suddenly his nephew, Gawain, leaps forward. And he says, no man, no, 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 don't do it, it's not worth it, man. This is beneath you. 
Let me do it. I'm the dumbest and the weakest. And the Green Knight accepts the substitution. He gets himself all ready and Gawain's like, hey, 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 no, no, no. What's your address first? If, if I'm gonna have to like find you in a year's time, where do you live? And the Green Knight mysteriously just says, you'll find me. And the Green Knight moves all of his luscious, it, it's described as very luscious and beautiful uh, locks of hair, his elbow length locks of hair. He pulls it back to reveal his neck. And Gawain's like, you know what? That's a great idea. Save me time uh, a year from now when I don't have to go and deal with him because he's already dead. So he chops off the Green Knight's head. Vorpal Blade, snick a snack. But the Green Knight wasn't left dead. And who should pick up his head and go galumphing homeward? The Green Knight, he didn't move. At all, just like he said, he didn't move during the strike. He picks up his own head, he gets up on his horse, he points the head in what he hopes is Gawain's general direction, and the disembodied head is like, you deserve a beheading on New Year's Day next year, buddy boy. You get ready. Hold on, says Gawain, y your head's off. It's only a flesh wound. The Green Knight splits. Everyone's freaked out for about two seconds before they start yucking it up like they think it's hilarious, which leads me to believe that they were quite drunk. So if the, uh, if the amount of time spent describing it is anything to go by, Gawain spends the better part of the next year getting dressed. Yep. Yep, yeah, we get it. He's got a pentangle on him. Yep, that's great. No, we don't need to know the history. That's fine. But finally, at the beginning of winter, he sets off on his journey to try and find the chapel of the Green Knight. He looked everywhere. He asked everybody. Hey, have you seen a guy? He's like, he's a giant with an itty bitty waist and he, he friggin loves green. Like, like too much. No one knows who the hell Gawain is talking about? Remember how many lines were dedicated to the description of green earlier? Well, there's this little bit where apparently while he's searching, Gawain fights serpents and wolves and wild men hiding in the rocks and, uh, and bulls and bears and boars and giants. Uh, but we don't get to hear those bits. Uh, <laughs> that, that takes only lines uh, 518 to 523. And the poet says, ah, oh, I couldn't even describe it if I tried, and so he doesn't try. Thanks. I'll get to hear about the history of the Pentangle. Now he's been traveling in the wind and the rain and the snow and like sleeping in his armor and everything's very rough. And despite bearing the holy symbol of the Pentangle, uh, he doesn't think, Gawain doesn't think to pray for help until Christmas Eve. And he stops and he prays and he says, oh man, Mother Mary, it would be so great if uh, you could show me the way to somewhere where I can attend mass. Because it is, after all, a holy night for this holy night. Ah, shut up, I'm funny. Oh, holy night. Anyway, even though he's been in this forest looking everywhere, uh, he didn't notice this castle that's like right behind him. Maybe it shimmered magically into view when he wasn't looking. But before he can get into the castle, he's gotta get past a porter. Oh, I love a good Arthurian porter. What does this one do? Oh, he just lets him in. Oh, okay. The porter's just like, you look like a knight. Bet you'll be welcome. Come on in. The one in Kilhuic? He wouldn't even let Arthur's own cousin in. You know what, it's fine. Doesn't even matter. Now the master of this, of this court, is Bertilac. He's huge and he has a big bushy beard. It's not described, but part of me also suspects he has an itty bitty waist. I wonder why that might be. <gasps> Spoilers. Bertilac greets Gawain and they go in uh, to where the court is having, they're sitting down for a, for a Christmas feast of their own. But here's the thing, uh, Gawain is um, doing some holy fasting right now, so he can't eat anything. So he just, they just fill him up on wine and he gets real drunk and starts telling them anything they ask. He's like, oh, y'all, y'all haven't seen like a, a big green guy, have you? And Bertilac smiles to himself and he's like, oh, haven't you heard? Lucky for you, I know the big green guy. He lives like two miles down the road. You'll be fine. Hang out with us until New Year's Day. And Gawain's like, sounds great. Promptly spends the rest of the night flirting with Bertilac's wife. 
Also, we get a description of um, this old crone who's, you know, she's like, you know, she's got the typical unflattering description. Plus she wears a wimple and she looks really cranky all the time. I wish I could say that that'll be important later. And I guess technically it will be. Now by the end of the night, Bertilac is leaping around the room, bouncing off the walls. He hangs his hat on, like, a stick. And he's trying to get everyone into the Christmas spirit. So he's just like, whoever gets the most laughs tonight wins my hat! Now, we never find out who does uh, win the hat. Gawain's just about ready to go to bed. But before he actually goes to sleep, he and Bertilac just sort of retire and hang out in front of the fire in Gawain's guest room. And they're having such a nice conversation. They get along so well. And Gawain's like, man, I should really leave tomorrow morning to go find this green dude. And Bertilac's like, no, don't, you should stay here with me. Stay one night more at least, please. And Gawain's like, you know what, sure. And because of your hospitality, I'm gonna do anything you tell me to do in the meantime, I'll do it. And Bertilac suddenly gets very serious and he grabs Gawain by the arm and he says, then here is what you will do. Tomorrow, I will take most of my peeps out and we're gonna go hunting. And you are going to stay here and hang out with my wife. Anything I get during the hunt, I'm gonna gift it to you when we get back. But anything that you are given while you're here, you have to give me. It'll be a trade. We're gonna, we'll swap. We'll both, we'll win things and then we'll swap it. Sounds great. Pinky swear. Pinky swear, bro. So the next morning, everyone goes out hunting. They catch a lot of deer. Hooray for them. Gawain, in the meantime, is hanging out in bed, just having a cheeky sleep in. It's what the week between Christmas and New Year's is for. But then while he's lying there, Bertilac's wife lifts the latch and comes on creeping into his room, peeking through his, his canopy curtains. She sits on the edge of his bed. Gawain's a little uncomfortable, to be honest, and so he just keeps his eyes closed and pretends to be asleep. He's like, maybe she'll leave. She doesn't leave, so then he has to awkwardly pretend to wake up. Oh, oh, what are you doing here? Oh, I can't. How long have you been here? I didn't hear you come in, he says. Bertilac's wife, who really should have a name, but is mostly referred to as the lady. The lady's like, that's pretty rubbish for a night, really. Shouldn't you be more alert? Gawain tries to uh, redirect them towards breakfast. Let's go get some brunch, you know? I am starving. But the lady's like, no, I want to talk here. I want to chat. And then very weirdly just says, she says she's going to tie him to the bed. And it's never, they don't like say that she ever did it, but it comes up like multiple times. I'm not here to kink shame, I would just like some resolution. Anyway, they hang out chatting in bed for a while and they actually get along really well. But then the lady starts goading Gawain and she's like, mm, I don't think you really can be Gawain, the famous knight of Camelot. And Gawain's like, what? Why? Excuse me? I've heard a lot about Gawain and he, by all accounts, is a real smooth talker. And if you were Gawain, you would have already kissed me by now. And Gawain's like, you can kiss me if you want. I'm not gonna stop you. And so they smooch. Oh, <gasps> scandal. When Bertilac makes it back from the hunt. We get two pages describing how to butcher a deer. I'm sure it must have been very useful or interesting to someone at some time. But Bertilac, as he said he was going to, hands over all of his venison to Gawain. And Gawain, knowing the promise he made and being a knight of honor, who made an oath, throws his arms around Bertilac's neck and he gives him a big ol' smooch on the lips. There is enthusiasm involved. Bertilac, blushing a little, is like, oh, who have you been making out with? Gawain's a little spooked and he goes, no one, that wasn't part of the deal I don't have to tell you, shut up. So anyway, they get drunk together again that night and they make the same deal again. This time Bertilac goes out hunting for a big old boar. Gawain, on the other hand, is again visited by the lady in his bedchamber. They chat and they laugh and then she goes, oh, I can't believe you forgot already. Forgot what? That you should kiss me. Gawain sighs and he's like, look, ma'am, I'm not really about kissing people without consent. You can kiss me though, if you wanna. So they smooch and they smooch again before the lady leaves. But like comes back with a pig's head on the stick. So now on the second day of Christmas, 
Burlack gave to me a pig's head on a stick. Gawain Frenches Burlack twice, just as he promised he would. You lucky duck, says Burlack. Burlack thinks that they should make the same deal again, but uh, Gawain's a little hesitant. He's like, we're getting, we're creeping on closer to when I have to go and face the Green Knight, so I should really probably leave tomorrow morning. But Bertie promises that he and his people will get Gawain to the Green Chapel on New Year's Day, and that Gawain has nothing to worry about. So, Gawain agrees. He is drunk again. And now, I'm drunk again. Next day, Bertalak goes out hunting again. This time, there's not much left in the surrounding woodland. He's only after um, one measly fox. This morning, the lady slips into Gawain's bedroom at dawn while he's sleeping, but for real sleeping this time. He's having a nightmare about how he might die in a couple days when he faces the Green Knight. And so when the lady opens the curtains wide and shouts, wake up, wake up, sleepyhead, it's time to be awake, Gawain's pretty chill about it. This time the lady figures that prior consent has already been established and so she greets Gawain with a kiss. And he's into it, but pretty quickly the lady starts being very overt in her intentions. You know, I'm, you know what I'm saying? And so after like an hour of coy giggling in bed and getting closer, Gawain's like, oh, I don't want to be rude, but I can't do this. Why not? Do you have a girlfriend? No. And also I'm saving myself for marriage. Can I just say, no means no woman. The lady does back off, but she says, fine, that's fine, but can I have another kiss to remember you by? So the two of them smooch again. The lady starts trying to give Gawain a token to remember her by. She takes off this magnificent golden ring and tries to hand it to him and he's like, hell no, no way! Because he knows that anything he's gifted he has to give to Bertalak and if he hands Bertalak his wife's ring, it's gonna go down. But the lady misinterprets. She's like, you don't like it because it's too rich, isn't it? It's pretty rich stuff. That's okay, I'll give you something that's not so rich stuff. And she takes off her belt, her green woven belt. Again, Gawain is like, no, no way. Because again, this will be a pretty identifying thing. And the lady's like, ugh. Oh. So now you won't take this because it's too poor? I'll have you know this belt isn't even that poor. It's actually a magic belt. Anyone who wears this belt can't be killed by anyone except, like, God. What now? This piques Gawain's interest. He's like, this could solve everything. For the first time, he realizes he could just break his oath. He could just lie to Bertalak and not give him everything he himself was given. This belt holds Gawain's salvation and so he takes it. He thanks the lady profusely, they smooch again, and then she leaves. Bertalak returns home and Gawain doesn't even wait. He just rushes up and kisses Bertalak three times. I quote, kisses him thrice as amiably and earnestly as ever he could. And Gawain plays it very cool when he immediately shouts, uh, that's it, that's all I was given today, no questions. Well, damn, says Bertalak, all I got you was this lousy fox fur. And everyone parties. Tomorrow is the day that he will have to face the Green Knight and he doesn't sleep a wink, but it's okay. He's very good at pretending. Gawain gets up at dawn, dresses himself, makes sure to put his new green belt under his clothes. He says goodbye, he thanks everyone. All the girls and boys of the court cry as he leaves. The porter gets down on his knees and he prays. God and Mary, save that good man, Sir Gawain. What a nice porter. Gawain's guide takes him on the path to the chapel and at a certain point he stops and he says, Sir, I can't take you any further, but I beg of you, please turn around, go anywhere else. If you keep down this road, you will be killed. But if you leave now, I, I'll lie to everyone. I will, I will not tell a soul that you ran away. I will tell everyone that you faced the Green Knight boldly. But in true Ulrich von Lichtenstein fashion, Gawain says, I will not run. All right, your funeral. Gawain follows the directions to get to the Green Chapel, but he doesn't see a chapel anywhere, especially a green one. There's a grassy knoll, and it's not even that green because it's snowing. But he wanders around in a huff, kicking rocks until uh, finally from a crag overhead, he hears this noise. It's this noise of someone sharpening a weapon on a grindstone. 
very loudly, the Green Knight sharpening his axe. Eventually he leaps down off the crag and he's holding this huge Danish axe sharpened to an incredibly fine edge. He holds it by the haft and uses it to vault over a creek and stands boldly before Gawain on the grassy knoll and makes fun of him for a while. Gawain isn't having it, he's like, just cut off my head already. And he presents his neck just as the other man did a year and a day earlier. And the Green Knight pulls back his axe, prepares to swing, swings, and Gawain flinches. And the Green Knight's like, ah, you flinched. You did, you flinched. That wasn't part of the deal. I didn't flinch when you cut off my head. I didn't even cut off your head and you flinched. Oh, what a loser. Gawain's like, shut up, try again. Green Knight pulls back the axe and prepares to swing and he swings and he stops short. Gawain didn't flinch this time, but the Green Knight still makes fun of him. Ah! You really thought you were dead? Look, who, who's this? Who am I being right now? Oh no, look, this is it's my final moment. I'm so scared. Ah, it's you! That's what you look like. Gawain starts blushing profusely and he gets very cross and he says, look, just cut off my head, all right? Just do it, do it now. So finally, the Green Knight pulls back his ax and he swings and he doesn't hold back. And it just nicks the side of Gawain's neck. Just enough to spill blood across the snow. And Gawain leaps back out of reach and shoves on his helmet and draws his sword and pulls his shield off his back. And he's like, you better, oh, you got one swing and that was it, you nicked me, that counts. That was your stroke, so if you come, if you come anywhere near me, I get to fight you. And the Green Knight calmly explains that he's not planning to fight Gawain anymore. In fact, the Green Knight isn't the Green Knight at all. He is Bertilak. <gasps> That was a little too much oxygen. And the Bertilak was taking pity on Gawain because he had challenged Gawain three times in the form of pimping out his wife. He'd tempted Gawain and Gawain had turned her down. The only time that Gawain betrayed him was when he took that belt and didn't give it back to Bertilak. And so the only piece of pity that Bertilak as the Green Knight did not take was leaving this cut on his neck. Because you betrayed me for your own survival and not to sleep with my hot wife, Bertilak says, I have decided to let you live. And Gawain's like, what the hell, dude? Why? Bertilak's like, meh, it was Morgana's idea. Because Morgana, half-sister of Arthur, enemy sorceress figure in the Arthurian legends, was just like kind of mad at uh, Guinevere and wanted to spook her by sending a green knight. Morgana made me look like this with her magic and whatever. Morgana, you know Morgana. You met her. She was the old crone standing next to my hot wife. And that's it. That's literally the only reason the crone was important. And so the green knight Bertilak is like, look man, Come back to my place, party with us. We're having another feast. We all love you there. Come stay with us. Come sleep with me and my wife. They're totally swingers. But Gawain is uh, pretty tired and pretty fed up, and so he's like, nah, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna head back to Camelot. Thanks though, bro. And Bertilek says, all right, you can do that. But you must do one thing. Forevermore, you must wear this ugly green belt to show that you broke your knightly oath, where it is a reminder and a mark of shame. And Gawain's like, oh man. But he goes back to the round table, back to Camelot, and he has to explain to all the other knights why he's wearing this hideous accessory. And they all just think it's really hilarious. And so they all agree that that'll be the symbol of the knights of the round table now. They'll all wear ugly green belts in solidarity. God bless us, everyone. And that's the story. It's got a little bit of Christmas, it's got a little bit of New Year's, it's got a lot of yeah. I hope you've all had lovely holidays, whatever those holidays may be. If you haven't celebrated your holidays yet, if they're coming uh, in, in January still to come, I hope that they are very good holidays for you. Look, there's no good segue for this, but I'd like for you all to meet the gentleman. Um, I got him for Christmas and I love him. So I, I would have him in my background at all times, but the the bookshelf isn't, the, he, he couldn't stand up can do it. Anyway, uh, I hope that you enjoyed the video. Apart from that, I do believe that's it. I'm done. Email this to your grandma. Uh, I'll see you some other time. It's very hot.